during an early brainstorming session, uh, exploring ideas for reunion presentations, someone suggested a session on theatrical or performing arts. Um, that someone, that would be me, and a supporter, Steve, uh, were rapidly volunteered to lead the session. So the two of us, uh, without claim of any special expertise, either in the theatrical arts or in homosexuality, but with some amateur, and I underline amateur experience, um, agreed to a, the precarious leadership position. As you might guess in a few minutes, we both have amateur experience on the stage and thus an interest in the performing arts. Uh, in fact, at some point in this presentation, you might wonder if you have stumbled on a session of Ted Max Amateur Hour, especially after hearing those superb TED Talks of yesterday afternoon. So what theater and or movie works might have a PEA connection? Uh, clearly, uh, a Heil might think of a separate piece, as you might too, for any of us who took English, in fact, all of us. But then Tea and Sympathy was also suggested by Steve, a great idea. As we read and reread the play, we found it impossible to read Tea and Sympathy without reflecting on how societal attitudes towards homosexuality have evolved. And thus, we decided to explore this topic, hoping that you might sit back and consider one of the huge changes in society uh, that have occurred over the past 50 to 60 years uh, after our relationship to PEA. Uh, during this discussion, we will present for your consideration an excerpt from Tea and Sympathy, as well as three other theatrical and cinematic productions from this greater than half century, oh my God, I'm still alive, um, I guess, since we were at PEA. Uh, since we want to give you all a chance to chi chime in, we will not be presenting a huge number of works. Uh, it's a huge uh, catalog, catalog of works. But we are going to present excerpts uh, that span the range of what we consider themes regarding treatment of the subject. I hope you've all received an email from Dan with the six page outline of happenings in theater and society put up side by side. I gleaned this from Ms. Google, of course, and from a book edit edited by James Fisher in published in 2008 and entitled, We Will Be Citizens, New Essays on Gay and Lesbian Theater. This was simply my attempt to distill what I could find regarding the trends in the evolution of the treatment of homosexuality in theater and in society at large. And finally, before I let Steve introduce the first two works from which we will present excerpts, uh, let me say that our less than original idea runs through the presentation, namely a hell of a lot has happened in the world since we graduated from PEA. Uh, a lot of that was reflected in what was presented yesterday. As regards homosexuality and theatrical productions, denial or using it as evil were perhaps dominant themes in our PEA and pre-PEA years. Then we graduated and things changed. So now it's time for Steve to introduce our first two pre presentations. I pass it to him. Okay, thanks, Peter, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for stopping by. We're going to begin by showing two short clips from the 1962 movie, Advise and Consent, uh. which was shown <laughs> to the PA, PEA student body during our time there as part of the wildly popular Saturday Night Film Series in the Thompson Gymnasium. Neither Peter nor I was present for this screening, but we have it on good authority. Well, Ed Wells tells us that these two scenes evoked a very loud, very raucous response from the audience. Mind you, it didn't take much to elicit a raucous response from that crowd. <laughs> but I think that the fact that this took place is indicative of a prevailing mindset at that time. No detailed synopsis is needed for our purposes here. I'll just say that the man we see first 
in the first of these clips, both of which are from there, very near the end of the movie, is a senator from Utah who is being blackmailed under circumstances that have not been explicitly explained. The senator goes to a New York club where he has been told he can find the person he wants to confront about the blackmail attempt. In the second clip, the senator's wife finds an envelope from the blackmailer on her doorstep. So I'm going to share my screen now. Here we go. This is from Advise and Consent. Let me hear a voice, a secret voice, a voice that will say, come to me and be what I Long alone, I have sung the loser's song. Well, come on in. We don't just stand there. Okay, the next excerpt is from the work that led us to select the theme from our talk today, uh, the play Tea and Sympathy by Robert Anderson. Anderson was a member of the PEA class of 1935. The work premiered on Broadway in 1953 and ran for 712 performances, and it also spanned a 1956 film of the same title. The story takes place during the spring term and centers on an upper middler named Tom. Mm. Tom. Tom is a sensitive boy with interests that don't quite align with those of the majority of his schoolmates. He is very inexperienced in matters of dating and love. And in that respect, he's very much like the majority of his classmates. But Tom's nonconformity leads to his being subjected to a considerable amount of baiting and ridicule from many of his peers. And his situation has just worsened dramatically as the result of his having been seen sunbathing naked in the sand dunes in the company of a faculty member. I really should issue a spoiler alert here, but it's important to know that Tom is not gay. Mm. This fact becomes clear in the play's final scene in which the lovely young faculty wife living in Tom's dorm tenderly shepherds him through his first sexual experience. In the scene Peter and I are about to read, Tom does not appear. It opens with Tom's roommate, Al, 
a star athlete, on the phone with his father, who has got wind of the recent incident and is not at all happy with the idea of his son rooming with the likes of Tom. At the end of the call, another dorm mate, Ralph, a loudmouth bully, played by Peter, I hasten to point out, uh, enters and gets into a heated discussion with Al. Peter, you ready? As ready as I can be. Yeah, Dad, I, I know Dad. No, I haven't done anything about it yet. Yes, Mr. Hudson says he has a room in his house for me next year. But I haven't done anything about it here yet. Yeah, okay, Dad. I know what you mean. I swear to God, I don't. I lived with him a year, and I don't. All right. Okay, Dad. No, no, don't you call. I'll do it right now. Hey, Al. Yeah? Uh, the guys over at Beta House want to know, has it happened yet? Has what happened? Has Tom made a pass at you yet? Are crying out loud. Okay, okay. You can borrow my chastity belt if you need it. That's not funny. No, I know it's not. Uh, the guys on the ball team don't think it's funny at all. What do you mean? The guy they're supposed to elect captain rooming with a queer. Uh, knock it off, huh? So you don't believe me? Wait and see. Anyway, my mother said I should save myself for the girl I marry. Hell, how would you like to have to tell your wife, honey, I've been saving myself for you, except for one night when a guy. Okay, okay. So you don't want to be captain of the baseball team. So who the hell cares? I don't, I'm sure. Look, why don't you mind your own business? What the hell fun would there be in that? Ralph, Tom's a nice kid. Yeah. That's why all the guys leave the shower room at the gym when he walks in. When? Yesterday. Today. You didn't hear about it? No. What are they trying to do? Hell, they don't want some queer looking at them and... Oh, can it? Go on up and bury your horny nose in your art models magazine. At least I'm normal. I like to look at pictures of naked girls, not men the way Tom does. Geez, I'm gonna push your face in in a minute. Didn't you notice all those strong man poses he's got in his bottom drawer? Yes, I've noticed them. His old man wants him to be a muscle man and he rode away for this course in muscle building and they send those pictures. Any objections? Go on, stick up for him. Stick your neck out. You'll get it chopped off with a baseball bat, you crazy bastard. Peter, if you would now introduce our next two clips. So I think you got a taste of uh, how homosexuality was treated in our PEA era, actually a little bit before as well. Uh, we will now leap forward and shift to an entirely different treatment of homosexuality in theatrical productions. A brief perusal of the right column on that outline, Society Happenings, uh, will remind you of the tumult in our world. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and do it. Let me just list a few names and events to jerk us forward from the 60s into the 80s. Rejection of Joe Carthy and Roy Cohn. Early gay rights demonstrations. Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy. Stonewall Inn riot in June 1969. Homosexuality dropped by the American Psychology Association as an illness. The Vietnam War and withdrawal. 
first March on Washington for gay rights in 79, and then the gay cancer, which morphed into the HIV AIDS epidemic of the 1980s and 90s. We could get bogged here, but let me move on. Larry Kramer's The Normal Heart was produced in 1985 at New York's Public Theater. It, in a nutshell, expressed anger with fiery polemics around the subject of gay cancer. It took another 20 years for the play to be done as a movie in 2014. Some very familiar stars are in it, including Mark Ruffalo, Julia Roberts, Jim Parsons, and Joe Mantello. In this scene, the character Tommy gets news from Ned about yet another death of a friend. This is Tommy. Tommy, it's Ned. Hey. Nick died. Shit. God damn. I'll call later when I know more about the memorial. Children. I have this tradition. It's something I do now when a friend dies. I save his Rolodex card. What am I supposed to do? Throw it away in the trash can? I won't do that. No, I won't. That's too final. Last year I had five cards. Now I have 50. A collection of cardboard tombstones bound together with a rubber band. I hate these fucking funerals. I really do. And you know what else I hate? I hate the memorials. That's our social life now, going to these things. Nick was a choreographer. I don't know if you knew that. He was just starting out, and he didn't tell a lot of people. He was waiting to invite you to his big debut at Carnegie Hall or some shit so we could all be proud of him. But he was so good. He had such promise. We're losing an entire generation. Young men at the beginning, just gone. Choreographers. Playwrights, dancers, actors. All those plays that won't get written now. All those dances never to be danced. In closing, I'm just going to say I'm mad. I'm fucking mad. I keep screaming inside, why are they letting us die? Why is no one helping us? And here's the truth. Here's the answer. They just don't like us. So I hope you all will agree uh, that is definitely a different treatment of homosexuality <laughs> and very much in your face. Probably needed in the 1980s when Dr. Fauci, to today's hero, was not very well appreciated by the gay community. No need to ask which character is gay and which one is straight, eh? It's pretty straightforward. Let us end our four excerpts with something milder, a resolution, if you will, of sorts, um, after the anger of these plays in the 1980s and the 1990s. This is a performance from a hit show, Fun Home, that won Best Musical in 2015 and 2016. 
It deals with a young girl coming to terms with her sexuality at different stages in her life. The tension in this show really is coming from the fact that her father is gay and has struggled with that fact his whole life. But this song has nothing to do with that tension. This song is a gorgeous song of self-discovery and I hope you will agree that it is extra no extraordinary. The name of the song is Ring of Keys. I think we've got some time left. I obviously talk too long. We don't have much time. So I apologize for um, spewing forth, but I'd love to have anybody who wants to jump in. If you don't look out, I'm gonna ask some questions that might poke you in your ribs. So say something. I would like to uh, share uh, one or two anecdotes that I think are relevant here. Um, I was particularly interested in Tea and Sympathy, uh, which I read. I don't remember whether I read it before I went to Exeter or shortly afterwards, but I learned that Robert Anderson, the playwright, had lived in Williams House, where I also lived. And the faculty resident in Williams House was Harris Thomas, who was a French teacher. Um, I never had him in French class, but he knew I was taking French and 
uh, was fond of engaging me in French conversation. And on one occasion, somehow, I must have brought it up, but I mentioned the play. And Mr. Thomas, uh, who was a, a kind, I think, fairly wise man, uh, probably in his late 60s at the time, um, said to me that Robert Anderson had been living in William's house with Mr. Thomas. He had been uh, the dorm, the Williams House faculty resident at that time too. And if you do the math, <coughs> I, class of 1935, this was, Mr. Thomas would have been a young teacher at the time. But he said to me in French, I told Anderson that if he meant to portray me as the <laughs> faculty resident in the play, I would kill him. Je le tuerai. <laughs> I think he said that as a joke, essentially. Obviously, he did not mean that. But the, what, a, a point that you need to understand here is that in the, in the play, the faculty resident is a latent homosexual. So I think that Mr. Thomas is seeing fit to say that to me sort of reinforces the prevailing attitude at the time. This is, this is a scourge that normal people just are not going to encounter. The other thing I want to share with you, I just found out yesterday, I had, uh, I went to a class or a session hosted by a teacher. It didn't really seem much like a class, but the teacher asked me where, you know, what dorm I had been in. I said, William's house. And he said, oh, William's house is now an all gender dorm. Hmm. And I said, well, <laughs> that, that has some meaning beyond boys and girls, right? And he said, yes, I mean, that's, that's for students exploring alternate paths. Uh, so I think the irony there is considerable <laughs> to go from William's house in the 1950s to an all gender dorm today. I wonder if anybody else has any thoughts about our time at Exeter uh, in this context. Well, Steve, I've raised my hand because I lived in William's house, as you know, we were there together. And the most dramatic part of the play is the ending. Uh, and of course, uh, Harris Thomas's wife was there and she was a very sweet woman. Uh, and I'm sure it was years and years where there was always that question of, well, is this play based on anything that happened? For real in William's house. It must have been difficult for her. So I wonder if she would have echoed <laughs> Harris Thomas's <laughs> sentiments. Uh, when I saw you were going to talk about the play, I bet if it were staged today, it could be interpreted that Tom is homosexual and that the generosity of the resident's wife is something of an attempt to, uh, you know, let him possibly get off the hook about what is truly his sexual nature. In other words, because this is done all the time now with older plays, you know, this could become a play that is more overtly an indication of a young homosexual. Well, Clyde, I, I, I think that's an interesting thought. Uh, it would need an alteration to the text of the play, I think, at least an extension, because the play ends on a particular note. It doesn't really uh, allow for much well, I mean, isn't the famous curtain line, when you speak of this in the future and you will be kind, and that's by the wife, right? Isn't that the curtain line? Right. Correct. <clears throat> well, that can be interpreted that, you know, be kind. And indeed, he probably will be because he's at least bi, if not uh, homosexual. 
Well, it would be interesting to see what a talented, imaginative director might do with it. Uh, Where is Mayor Ribolo when we need him? <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, I'm just playing with it, and you're and you're right. It's tough because oh, it's intentions. Not oh, that. it's interesting, and the and the thought occurred to us also. We, uh, Peter and I, actually discussed it. Could you stage this work with you know in that light? And uh, I I think we agreed. No, you couldn't. Not as written, but maybe you could. I mean. Uh, there's a lot you can do with theater, I suppose. And, uh, but I think it is interesting that uh, I'm not aware of volumes of commentary on this particular play that have been produced in the intervening years, but I think it was sort of celebrated at the time as a, an enlightened sympathetic treatment of people who didn't quite fit in. The, Tom didn't quite fit in for other reasons, but um, it's hard for me to look at the play now and not have my first reaction be, so, <laughs> what's the problem here? You know, the problem is not. Uh, or Peter, rather, I, or I rather love wow, your... wow, this is dated. Right. Yeah. Um, Speaking of which, Peter, I'd love your commentary on the on the arc of this issue over 60 to 70 years. Um, I forget when it was. I was reading about the fact that in the 1950s, if they discovered you were a homosexual, uh, you'd be thrown out of work. So we've clearly moved a ways away from that. And my question to you all, having looked at this, is given where we are today with respect to sexuality, homosexuality, gender, selection. I mean, we've moved so far from the 1950s. What has allowed our, our uh, society to adapt at that <clears throat> point, I suppose? I think, I think it is simply communications. I, I think as we have become so much more communication savvy as movies have progressed, as we all have gone to film after film after film, as we work on the internet, as we do Twitter and Facebook, not that I do them, but, but all of those things have facilitated, facilitated a conversation where we are far more tolerant, I think, hmm. of all kinds of things. I think it's also a matter of access to other people who actually live yeah. that life without appearing threatening. I yeah. mean, you really see homosexual couples frequently. I mean, I know half a dozen at least. And yet in Exeter, you never, I was never aware of people who openly were in love with each other of the same sex. I mean, I know that that sort of thing happened, but, uh, to see other people, like you, you gain understanding and tolerance and, and empathy by seeing people like that and knowing people like that. My comment, my comment would be 1968. We had a presentation on the anti-war. Certainly there was tremendous uh, change in racial, I think uh, with view of sexuality. I think this is all together stemming from originally the anti-war protest mm -hmm. with the societal change of all of these uh, particular subsets moving in a uh, more open direction. I don't think that you can take uh, views on sexuality and isolate it from the other two, uh, you know, views on militarism, uh, views on capitalism, views on race. I think uh, they're all, uh, all unified. Great. Jim Blake? Um, let's see, do I need to unmute? No, you're good. Okay. Um, our senior year, uh, there was a new professor, a guy named Rodney Marriott, who was a, uh, he was living in Wheelwright. Lou, maybe you remember him. Very nice guy. I think a bunch of us always suspected he was gay. And I think many years later, he came out as gay. But he really started 
reviving or building up the theater program at Exeter. And I remember, and I think it was in the spring, there were a couple of short plays that were put on in a new theater, uh, not newly built, but just a new space that was used for theater. And, and one of them um, was Zoo Story by Edward Albee. Yeah. And I remember seeing it, it was very moving. And I'm just looking at the summary of it in Wikipedia, and it doesn't mention anything about a gay theme, but it does talk about, explores the themes of isolation, loneliness, miscommunication as anathemization, social disparity and dehumanization, blah, 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 in a materialistic world, whatever all that means. My question is, did any, and people I think by then knew Edward Albee was a gay, who was gay and a well-known playwright. Anybody look at that, that play at the time and think, maybe that's talking, approaching the uh, alienation that gay people might feel. I don't, it didn't occur to me, but thinking about Mr. Marriott, thinking about Edward Albee, and just wondering if that was sort of opening the door to start talking about things like that. I remember it was very powerful theater. Well, yeah. so Mayor Mayor Ribolo and Fred Grandy performed that. Yeah, uh, it was in a bravura performance. Yeah, uh, I remember. I remember that Fred could cry. You know, he oh. he, he had real tears. Yeah, down in that. I but I I will say no. It certainly didn't occur to me. I was not nearly sophisticated enough to have such things occurring to me, but I would say that that was right at the time when the Rodney Marriott's of the world uh, might have been ready to make a little noise. And getting back to what Mal said, I agree. I, I absolutely think the the these things happen sort of in tandem. And I think the civil rights movement starting out as a racial justice movement had a lot to do with it. I, I think it's sort of, and, and TV was coming into its own at that time. And we all saw people being horribly treated for no good reason. And I think that that consciousness, that sensibility sort of evolved to include lots of other uh, topics. I think that I, Malcolm hit it on the head there I think that society was changing and we were just at the lead edge. We were in college when the world changed dramatically. I was at Columbia, those at Berkeley and other colleges, you know how the world turned upside down in those four years and the years to follow. And I think that when we were at Exeter, as I mentioned at a different meeting, that many, we were homophobic and all of that. But as you know, you, you in retrospect, you wonder what all those male faculty who were unmarried, you know, how many of them were whatever they were, you know, but it was sort of unspoken like Artie Landers, you know, we just tolerated him and he didn't molest me anyway. And I don't know if he bothered other people, but no. that kind of stuff went on. And so anyway, you know, though today, 55 years later, you know, most of us have had our epiphany whenever it may have arrived, you know, and uh, that we see the world differently and the world has changed around it. And, you know, you know, I, I was asked on the opening night, what did I learn from, or what did I wish I had learned? And in retrospect, I learned to keep listening and, and listening to others and changing. And I think that we've changed and the world has changed. I think that these, and I give kudos to Steve and to Peter for bringing this up and demonstrating it so dramatically. Uh, I thought this was a great presentation and I think it sort of, in a nutshell, brings home that this huge transition in our world, certainly there's been political change, but I think that this change about sexuality, I have like one of my relatives just came out as, uh, you know, sort of gender neutral trans and so, you know, as a family, we're trying to help this person go through the changes and, and facing this, uh, their reality. Yeah, is being binary, sorry. In any case, I've spoken too long, 
but I think that Peter and Steve, you did a great job and I, I'm happy to be part of this conversation. Thank you. You're, you're kind. I will, I will just 30 seconds. For <laughs> me, it's an intersection of two very important parts of my life. <clears throat> um, I practiced medicine through the HIV AIDS epidemic. Uh, it was a hell of an experience. Mm -hmm. And I have two uh, daughters who are both in the theatrical arts. Uh, so as the saying goes, I know lots of gays. <laughs> um, but I certainly didn't know much about it. Uh, the reason it was interesting to me is the arc of this self-realization was huge and steep for me. I don't know that I was homophobic. I was I was sexually gaga. I mean, I was sexually out to lunch. Uh, and all of a sudden, all of this Oh, there's, they're heterosexuals. Oh, they're homos. Oh, they're bisexuals. Oh, they're transsexuals. Uh, and then, oh, yeah, people get sick. Um, and can I help them? And for a while, I couldn't help them at all. Uh, and then, oh, it's not a gay cancer. In fact, you can get it by good old fashioned uh, heterosexual activity. You know, you can see where I'm going. It was quite a roller coaster ride. Uh, of 55 years of experience for me. So that's one of the reasons why I took a deep breath and said, all right, Eric, all right, Henry, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your boldness. And you know what it gets you. We're going to call on you again. <laughs> I think I better leave the meeting now. <laughs> Can I just quickly ask, is there anybody else other than Ed who remembers seeing advice and consent at PEA? No. How about West Side Story? Yes, I, yes. I remember it. You remember all that noise that went with that? It was they shut it down. Yes, they <laughs> yeah. shut it down. Thirds of it. It was right before we went on vacation. I think when 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 Chris right before Christmas vacation sometimes. So. I never saw the rest of it for twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> what I remember from the movie is Herb Foster's comments with his distinctive voice. You immediately knew who it was usually referencing sexuality of females on the screen. Yeah. <laughs>